Hi, and welcome to Voices in the Wilderness. We're a show on science and faith and um, where people have been asking questions, um, both skeptics and Christians and um, people who are wrestling with how to integrate or incorporate or wrestle with, with the areas that perhaps sometimes seem to con conflict between science and, and faith and religion. And just try to figure, figure it all out, talk through our ideas. Um, some people are in the process of deconstructing or reconstructing or maybe just rearranging or house cleaning their, their, in their faith life. And we want to be part of your journey. Um, so we bring on different voices, voices in the wilderness to help people who are wandering around looking for um, companionship and looking for people to point to Jesus and point to truth. Um, and we want to open up conversations uh, along along our faith journey. So if you're watching live on Facebook or on YouTube, feel free to uh, enter comments or questions in the in the chat boxes and we'll keep an eye out for those and hopefully um, address them along the way. And today we have special guest AJ Polarenz, who's a PhD and is the director of the Center for Faith and Learning at Anselm House a Christian study center at the University of Minnesota. He received his PhD in astrophysics from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, where he studied the pre-supernova evolution of stars that are about 10 times as massive as our sun. He continued his education at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, where he obtained an MDiv after which he taught for 11 years in the physics and engineering department at Wheaton College in Illinois and co-directed the Wheaton College Science Station, a field station in the Black Hills in South Dakota. His research at Wheaton focused on modeling the evolution of a particular class of binary stars, describing the conditions that would lead to the formation of double neutron stars and which form the progenitors of gravitational wave sources. Since the summer of 2020, he is associated with Ansem House, where he leads the university engagement initiatives, inviting speakers to campus to engage in the various disciplines with the Christian intellectual tradition, organizing university roundtables about the big questions and coming along, alongside of Christian faculty to support them in integrating their faith and their work. Uh, welcome, AJ. In fact, I just got a postcard in the mail about one about some of your upcoming events, including Captured by the Stars, Why Do We Look to the Heavens, um, which sounds really fun, and I plan to attend it. Um, awesome. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So if anybody is local, would you just mention quickly what, what is this yeah. this event, Captured by yeah. the Stars, for the future in Minnesota? Yeah, so uh, every year we put on a lecture at Ensom House um, in science and religion. So at the interface of science and religion, obviously big, big questions there. And uh, this year uh, we invited uh, brother Guy Consolmagno, who is uh, the director of the Vatican Observatory in Italy, to come and speak to us about the intersection of faith and astronomy, but deeper maybe faith and uh, science in general. And uh, so he is, uh, he's a very well-known astronomer uh, and also earth scientist. He studies meteorites, um, but he also uh, speaks a lot about and thinks a lot about the interaction between science and faith. And so he will give the Anderson lecture, which is one of our signature lectures at Anson House uh, this year on April 17. So if you're in the Twin Cities or somewhere in the area right here, April 17 is a Monday night, seven o'clock in McNamara. Uh, you can find more information on the website and some house.org um, and you can uh, find all the information there should be great he's awesome. a great communicator yeah i'm looking forward to it uh i have read his book would you baptize an extra extraterrestrial it was quite interesting. yeah that's quite a title right <laughs> yes it was a fun book too yeah kind of a conversation and interesting questions that were in it so um, well, John hasn't joined us yet, so I assume that means he's still getting things set up on Facebook and YouTube, um, which may mean we're not quite live on both of those, ho hopefully soon. Uh, so why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about your family and spiritual background to get us we, started. We are live on both. We are, okay. <laughs> so oh, good. Everything's good. I was just uh, enjoying the conversation. Yeah. Also. All right. Yeah, so... I, uh, I grew up in the Netherlands, so that's where my accent is from, if you're wondering about that. Um, grew up in the Netherlands in a Christian family. 
so my um as far as we can go back almost um my ancestors have been part of like church in the netherlands which is a huge blessing and i always um think about that how i think how much of a role my my parents and my grandparents have played in my spiritual formation um not only in kind of conversations but also in the prayers um and how they kind of like prayed for me and um in the times that i was in university i was struggling with all kind of different things um, and before that and after that obviously as well um so i grew up in the netherlands um did my undergraduates and master's and PhD in Utrecht University. Actually, I started, maybe maybe interesting for you, Christine, I started actually uh, applied physics, a little bit more engineering physics. Um, and the reason for that was that my, my father had cancer when I was 12 and 13 years old. And so I, uh, as someone who was mathematically and physically minded, I, I wanted to, uh, to uh, be active in that and kind of like make my contribution to kind of medical physics um, and kind of like radiation therapy and like all the things that I saw that my father was going through. But when I started uh, studying um, uh, applied physics um, at Twente University, which is uh, a little bit towards the east in the Netherlands, um, it, was, uh, it was too applied for me. <laughs> the questions that they were asking were not the question that I was deeply interested in. I was much more interested in kind of the bigger questions of meaning and purpose in the universe, uh, of the evolution of the universe itself, of what, are, what are natural laws and how does it work and all those different kind of things. So I actually decided to transfer to a different university to study physics and astronomy. And so that's what I did. I got my undergraduate degree in physics and astronomy, got my master's PhD. <clears throat> I studied indeed kind of like stars that are just ready to explode as a supernova. So the way that I describe my research for layman is always like I explode stars in my computer, which is not totally true, but there's some grain of truth in that. Um, after that, um, I, as, as a lot of people, obviously in that phase of life, uh, you ask yourself, like, what am I going to do with my life? And because I went through a period of very severe doubt in my second, third and fourth year of college, where I really questioned the Christian faith, questioned what, what actually who Jesus is and whether, whether I could believe in him whether God was the creator of the universe, whether they even made sense to think about those kind of things as a physicist or astronomer, where we can just explain everything through natural laws and physical processes. So I really struggled with those deep questions, eventually questions of morality. Um, in my fourth year, I got through that, um, first of all, by the grace of God. Like, I still cannot explain exactly what happened, that, I, that those questions didn't disappear, but I was able to kind of work through those questions and hold things in tension. Uh, partly also through an elder of my church who visited me um, and uh, was able to engage with me in those questions and prayed for me. And I think the Holy Spirit was working in my heart and my life to kind of like awaken a longing to belong to the Christian community again, to uh, find answers. Um, and so, in, an, in a slow process of, uh, of several months to almost a year, I kind of was able to kind of like climb out of my doubts, uh, still wrestling with those kind of things, but also come back to the Christian faith. Uh, but it was pretty intense, um, but at the same time also um, a deeply life-giving at the same time. So um, when I was working for my PhD, I still encountered questions and doubts, and so I still actually d would describe my faith, and that's how I described it to my students at Wheaton as well, as a contested faith. And it's not easy for me always to believe. I have a lot of questions. I want to work through those questions, um, and those questions actually keep me kind of like on my toes and keep me sharp, uh, so that I never take it for granted what I believe. But I was I was thinking about like what I'm going to do after my PhD, and um, if you continue in, in astronomy. Um, and physics, especially in a small country like the Netherlands, um, then you have to do several postdocs. Uh, that basically means that for two or three years you're associated with an institute somewhere else, and then another institute somewhere else, another institute somewhere else. So it's kind of like all very short-term appointments, and you live kind of like out of your suitcase almost. The way that some people describe it is kind of a scientific nomad, so a nomadic lifestyle. And I wasn't very interested in that, to kind of like only invest in myself to become the best in my, in my field, so to say. Um, and then, um, and just only focus my life on science. And so I actually decided to kind of quit astronomy and pursue theology. And the reason for that was the period of doubt that I, that I experienced. And I wanted to pursue theology with the idea to be able to speak as an astronomer into the world, like as a scientist into the world of the church, where there was a lot of misconceptions about what science actually is and how we can think about like origins questions. And then as a theologian, someone trained in theology, being able to speak in the sciences, because there's also a lot of misconceptions about what theology is and misconceptions about life in general. 
So a lot of people are still yearning for kind of meaning and purpose, are not able to find it anywhere, are trying to find it in all kind of different places. And obviously as a Christian, I was able to help them work through those kind of questions, even at the University of Utrecht already. We had many, many wonderful conversations, many people, many of my friends. Um, and I had some like, I, I want to know more about how I can actually connect the Christian faith and the rich intellectual tradition that we have with the questions that they're struggling with. So I, just studied, I decided to study theology. So I uh, moved to the States. Um, there's there's some good theology degrees that you can get in Europe as well. But um, uh, I moved to the States uh, and studied for four years at Covenant Theological Seminary. A uh, wonderful time, a uh, hard time, um, partly because like Hebrew and Greek are hard in quantum mechanics sometimes. So where, uh, where I... Uh, um, I struggled with quantum mechanics in my physics uh, in my physics degree. Hebrew and Greek don't come easy either, but a wonderful time, and especially um, learning b- the Bible. Just not only just learning the, how how to read the Bible well. Um, I also learned hermeneutical principles. Um, so really, kind of the discussion about like what does it mean actually to read this text, and is there a meaning in this text, and how can we find the meaning in this text, and how can we communicate the meaning in this text. And then also kind of missiological principles. So what does this what does this text mean to other people and to people in other worldviews? And so the, the my favorite kind of ideas were kind of biblical theology, seeing this big overarching storyline in the Bible, and connecting our own human existence with kind of points in a storyline or basically situating ourselves in that storyline. Um, something that I was never taught. It was more like kind of like little kind of like sometimes proof texting or little stories, but to be able to see that in this whole overarching line and to be able to situate myself in there and say like, actually this story that I am part of actually is able to make sense of my life in a way that, for example, N.T. Wright writes about it in kind of like his book, A Simply Christian, which came out some in the same time as I was in seminary. So it was actually quite influential. He writes about kind of like ideas of um, um, beauty and spirituality and awe and wonder and how that actually makes sense in a Christian story and how there are echoes of something that is better um, and how that makes a lot less sense sometimes in a naturalistic story. So I was able to uh, kind of connect those kind of dots, the biblical theology, then hermeneutics. How do you read the Bible? What kind of principles do you read? And how do you read the Bible responsibly? And then also kind of missiological principles. Um, so how do you communicate this to other people? So that's that's a that's an important part of kind of like my own background, my own story, and then I was able to put it into practice at Wheaton College, teaching there for eleven years, and really kind of like wrestling with the students, like okay, if you study science, how do you kind of like incorporate those ideas um, in in studying science in your life, in the way that you look at the world, in the way that you look at the sciences itself as well? Um, we can go deeper into that if you want to. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, And so then it sounds like that Anselm House was just the right progression for developing more of this. Tell us about your transition and what brought that about and and what is Anselm House? I've got to throw the flag here before we jump into Anselm House. Uh Uh You you covered a lot there, doctor. So I I just have a couple of questions moving through that. The dark night of your soul in college when you started to question your faith was that because of your studies yes it was okay yeah 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 so the way that i think the way that it started for me um was that um that i started but studying physics and astronomy and especially cosmology when you get this idea that the whole universe and especially the evolution of the universe can be explained by physical principles. So in my first year, I started like, okay, here's here's the Big Bang. Um, here's what we all know about the evolution of the universe. This is how physics kind of relates to that. This is how we can actually explain a lot of different things. Um, so that, that kind of like started kind of this kind of like little nagging voice, like, okay, if all of this can be explained and if all of like our current universe like the history of the universe, but also our current universe can be explained by just the laws of physics. Like where is God involved? What kind of role does he play in that? Can we see him? Can we experience him? And so kind of like that question then started spiraling in my own mind and say like, well, we have the laws of nature. <laughs> we have like the evolution of the universe, which is also primarily arranged by kind of the laws of nature. There is actually not a whole of places where God is then active. 
and so that 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 raised a lot of questions to me so eventually then kind of like because no one really helped me think through that that's another kind of like part of this whole story there's a sense in which like a lot of students and myself as well are especially if you come from a conservative christian background you feel a little bit ashamed about the fact that you doubt your faith and so you don't really want to talk too much about it and so i wasn't really looking for help i wasn't really asking people to help me struggle through those kind of questions certainly not initially anyway so that initially led to the idea that if god is not really involved in this universe is he still the creator of everything? Is he still the sustainer of everything? Does he still provide for us? And I was kind of like sparring down. And I was like, I don't know. I honestly have no idea whether God is really involved in this universe. And when you kind of get those kind of ideas, those not doubts kind of creeping up, it's kind of more and more of those kind of things, those ideas that you that you believe start falling. So eventually um, you, you ask yourself the question, like if God is not involved in this universe, is he involved in my life? And that's like, I don't know. I have no idea where he's involved in my life. And that then leads to the conclu- that, to the question, like, what about Jesus? Is Jesus involved in my life? And I'm like, I don't know. And then you get to the question, like, what about Jesus' uh, death and resurrection? And, like, the effects that it have, has on me. For example, did he really save me? And you, have, and you ask the question, like, I don't know. <laughs> and so, like, it's kind of like this, kind of like this, this spiral where you go deeper and deeper and deeper in more and more doubts because no one is helping, was at that moment helping me. I wasn't really opening up about it. I was just processing it all my, for myself. And so, like, yeah, God as creator became very far away from me. And then Jesus as my savior became also pretty far away from me. I was still reading my Bible. I was still going to church. On the outside, I always say this to people, on the outside, I was kind of like a happy, clapper Christian. It was fine. But on the inside, I was just torn apart by my doubts. And that's something that I've seen quite a bit also with my students at Wheaton sometimes, that people don't really have a different way of understanding themselves from the inside as from the outside. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that kind yeah, of does you know, and I into, think, yeah. Uh, I, I think, too, then some, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I would say sometimes, too, when people ask, they get answers like, well, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You shouldn't have doubts. Mm-hmm. And and that doesn't help. Yeah. I mean, to me, when that would happen to me way too often, um, I what I heard was, you don't really care about me. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't really care about me. You don't care that I'm wrestling with this. You're not willing to listen. You're not willing to help. I mean, I didn't even need them so much to have answers, but just to help find answers or to point me places. And, and, um, I don't know. I think that's, I think that's almost worse is if you, if you risk asking a question to be shut down. Yeah. Well, well, that sets me up perfectly for this question leading into Ansem House, which is the question I cut off my, my dear co-host about. And that is this, there is a big difference between the queen of the sciences, right? Theology Mm -hmm. and the scientific method you find in your disciplines. So uh, many people have pointed out that their questions are part of their work when it comes to science. They're encouraged. That's how we progress. It's how we grow. It's it's how we kind of sift through hypotheses that that are going to die, die out or maybe just leave us a residue of evidence that takes us to a truer path and um, and that which is something we can hold on to. But in Christianity, very often, especially in the modern church, questions are not greeted with any sense of warmth. Mm-hmm. They're 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 looked at like the fiery darts of the devil. Doubt is considered a, a negative thing. It's it's um, a sign of weakness of faith. And for many people, not just in your own story, but for many people, they don't come out with questions because they'll be treated like Christine was. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they don't want to be seen as somebody who has a weak faith or is lacking in that area. So my question to you, and this is going to be... Um, a little bit tough, but it, it, it's ironic that, you know, the divide, I believe, in in the modern church and with science came with the stars, came in astronomy, right, with the discoveries and, and the, the theories of um, Copernicus, Galileo, even Kepler. And yet 
you were you were drawn um, further in, I guess, by that same question. So I get why faith needs to integrate science because no one wants to look the fool. We, we want to be in touch with reality and we want to believe that our faith or our holy scriptures inspired by God are not contradicting the book of nature that he also spoke without stuttering. So I see why faith needs science. I have a feeling there are a number of scientists who, who don't share our faith, who, who are watching this right now saying, why would science need faith when you look at the history of the relationship between science and faith, and it has been more of an obstacle than it has been wind in the sails? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, how much time do you have? <laughs> so, um, so one of the one of the ways that I have approached that question, there's several 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 ways in which I've approached that question. One of them right now at Ansem House as well is um, we're all looking. At least I hope many people are looking for the big questions and the big answers. And that sounds very modern, right? Like the big story and things like that. Um, but this uh, this is more like, what is this universe? Who are we? Why are we here? Is there meaning? Is there purpose in this universe? And even though postmodernism um, often has said, like, there actually is no meaning, there is no purpose, you just have to create it yourself. Many people actually don't believe in that. <laughs> Many people are still looking for meaning, are still looking for purpose, are still looking to make sense of this world. And so the sense-making is something that's very important. It's kind of like something innate that we uh, that we kind of live with. Like we are sense-making people. Um, and so in the modern university, and so that's where Ansem House comes in. And in the modern university, there's not a whole lot of room for sense-making, for people to really explore those kind of questions. Um, it's very fragmented. It is very... Um, uh, how do you say it, like in kind of cocoons, like this person is working on this kind of research, this is on this work kind of research, and there's not a whole lot of interaction. And then it's not only fragmented, it's also kind of commodified. So there's a lot of money available and a lot of money that uh, needs to be spent. And so there's a lot of pressure for money and to kind of like, kind of hold on to kind of like your kind of slice of money. And so you need to be very focused in your research, which doesn't help you to kind of like go a little bit broader and wider and things like that, and to ask yourself the bigger questions. And so where the university originally was kind of created as like universitas, right? So kind of like thinking about the whole, about all the different questions about the whole of reality, how this comes together. At the moment, that is not really what the university is doing anymore. The university is much more focusing on very, very small slices of truth, so to say. And so, um, what 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 I try to do, um, and what Ansem House tries to do is say, like, okay, people, like that is the pursuit of truth that you're going for and going after here is an, is a great thing. That is something that we want to um, affirm, that we want to uh, support you in. But there are bigger questions, questions of meaning, purpose, question of origin, question of who we are as human beings. How should we live in this universe? And all of those bigger questions are really relevant questions because those are the questions that actually make sense of your world. And so those questions are not really answered anymore by the by the disciplines that you can find at the univer university. And so there, there needs to be bigger answers. And so the big questions that everyone is asking, uh, hopefully everyone is asking, when you're searching for the truth and a kind of a whole truth, those questions not only require the input of science they also require the inputs of the arts and philosophy and what i don't say is also kind of like religion religious perspective so many people in this world are religious and so they have something to say about those really deep questions that that all of us are struggling with and if you say like oh well that's religion that's outdated that's oppressive and we do not give you a place at the table anymore then you're merely already kind of like cutting out a large percentage of the people and a large percent of what they believe. And you say like, well, the only answers that actually can make sense are the answers from like the sciences, but that's not really respectful. <laughs> right. And that's not really, uh, um, help like, giving people the dignity and respect of who they are and what they think and kind of like, uh, giving them a voice at the table. And so I think like, even in our current climate where we are living, 
uh, where maybe there's more, there, there's so much polarization, first of all, right? Where you actually, where people on different sides of the political spectrum are not even talking with each, with each other anymore. But we should do at the university where hopefully most people are there for kind of like this kind of marketplace of ideas, right? We're listening to everyone, we're sifting everything, we're willing to kind of like engage with all these different ideas. The, the religion should have a place at the table as well. Because I think religion is actually able to bring a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding of this universe to the table that the sciences and all the fragmented kind of like disunity almost are not able to bring to the table. And for me as a Christian, I do believe that the Christian intellectual tradition is is really well positioned to be able to, to be a participant in that in that conversation. And that's what we try to do at Anselm House in some of our kind of like more university wide uh, events that we organize. So um, talk about the idea about the difference between confidence and certainty. Mm -hmm. um, because I hear I hear in your struggle that you went from um, a, a period of time where you probably had neither confidence nor certainty uh, mm -hmm. on your beliefs. And, uh, you know, I, in conversations with you, I've heard you talk about these two two concepts. And, and how do you bring that into conversations on the, the subject? Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very good question. So the way that I got to this whole idea of like confidence and certainty was in a class that I took in seminary. Um, and it was, um, it the class was itself was called Covenant Theology, so kind of the biblical story. And I started to get a grasp on this, of this story that we live in, right? So the biblical story. And at the same time, I confront or contrasted that with the story that uh, science, contemporary science is telling us. So where the Christian story, the biblical story is the story of like creation and then the fall and then God electing Abraham and uh, the people of Israel to be a blessing to this world and then the coming of Jesus and then the church, and then kind of like the new heavens, new earth, so to say. That's kind of the big overarching story that the Bible tells you and that we can kind of orient ourselves towards. Um, in the sciences, there's a different story. And that story is the story of like um, this universe came into being through the Big Bang. And there was a cosmological evolution where stars and galaxies and planets um, were formed. Then you get like the evolution of like life. On, on Earth, so there's this Earth right here that we live on right now that eventually uh, developed like some very primitive life forms that evolved deeper and further into kind of more um, uh, complex life forms. And then you get the development of, um, of humans, um, of sentient beings, and then a kind of a cultural and a technological evolution. So it's kind of like this, this cosmological evolution, evolution of life, so biological evolution, and then a cultural evolution where kind of cultures come into being and then kind of the development of technology. So that's where we are living right now. So it's a story of four parts almost, even though some of them overlap a little bit. And it's all like, okay, like, so do we live in this, this story? And it's almost like two stories that are crossing each other continuously, right? Because we do live in this one story of like, at least that's what I believe, like, creation for redemption um, and glory. And we also we also live in this story that the natural world tells us. And so where, how do we come, how do we think about these two stories? And so um, a concept that came up in, um, in a lot of like writing about science and faith was kind of worldview. Like what kind of lens do you have when you look at those two stories and how do you interpret those two stories? So um, I was quite influenced by those by kind of that, that worldview lens, that idea about how do you interpret these different stories, but also came a little bit disenchanted with it because it didn't really solve anything. So um, in seminary, I was, I came across like the idea of actually like not across the idea, but like I was introduced to the idea of epistemology. So um, in philosophy, there's kind of three different big fields. One of them is ontology, like what is what is there and um, like what is this reality made of? Uh, second one is epistemology, like how do we know these kind of things? And then the third one is ethics, how do we live? And often there's like logic as well as like the fourth view. And that's like epistemology is kind of a big question because like it's the question of truth. How do we know what is true and how do we know what is not true? And how can we kind of like live in those stories and kind of find truth? And how does then the, the truth of the scriptures compare with the truth of like scientific stories? And especially how does the truth of this overarching narrative, the biblical narrative, compare with the truth of like the scientific narrative? So you get that, that's a very tense question there. And uh, there's a lot at stake there. And so I, I, I read this book by Leslie Newbigin, 
who was a missionary in India. And um, after he worked there for many, many years, he came back to England, that's where he originally was from, and he realized that the British church was very modernistic and had a very high high level of certainty in kind of the biblical story, but was not able to communicate that to uh, the culture because the culture became very postmodern. And um, so Leslie Newby again, when he came back to England, had, he, he was very surprised about that. And he really started thinking about like, what does it mean for a church to be stuck in modernity and to be kind of like almost addicted to certainty in an, and to communicate to a culture that doesn't want to have anything to do with certainty. <laughs> and so um, he wrote this book called Proper Confluence. Um, and that was deeply influential in my faith journey. And it also kind of set the stage for kind of basically the project that I'm working on ever since, like making sense of my own life and making sense of like science and faith in terms of epistemology. So what Leslie Newbigen says is like um, in the, um, you can go back um, to Descartes, for example. So Descartes got this question, like, how can we prove that God is real? There was a lot of skepticism in his days, and, he's, and uh, his answer was, well, let's, let's prove it, and let's see what we can do this. And so eventually he came to this, this one statement of which he was, but he said, 100% certain, I think therefore I am, cogito ego ergo sum in Latin. So I think therefore I am. That was the, the only thing, after he used all his skepticism and all his doubt, that's the only thing he was certain about. Like, I am a thinking being. And therefore I am. And then based on that, he built up a whole new framework of all the other things that he was certain about. As we get this, this whole idea of like Cartesian certainty, a certainty that can be proven uh, in one way or another. So almost mathematical. And Newman argues that the Christian church took over that idea of, of Cartesian certainty, that actually God needs to be proven. That if you want to believe certain things, in the, in the scriptures, you actually need to prove those kind of things. And so that's where we get, like, obviously, like, um, some of the uh, the ideas that we still live with in Christian circles, especially some of the other, uh, some conservative Christian circles, where um, the Bible needs to be proved, uh, proven, um, nature needs to be proved, needs to prove God's existence, and all this kind of, like, proofs for the existence of God. Um, but... But Newbigin argues for, he says, like, that was actually the death of the Christian faith, because faith is never meant to be proven. Faith is always entrusting and giving yourself to someone. And it's never about proof and about certainty, but it's about confidence and le levels of confidence. And so co confidence, the root of confidence actually comes from confida, which is basically faith and trust. And so the deepest core of Christianity is not so much like... Um, mathematical truths, the deepest core of Christianity is that you actually give yourself to a person, namely Jesus Christ. So whenever I'm in those conversations about science and faith, I always stress and emphasize that there actually is no absolute certainty, right? Even mathematics. So when people think about like, what is the most certain thing in this universe? Well, there must be mathematical proofs. Actually, mathematical proofs eventually also break down. There's Gödel's theorem that basically says even like in mathematical kind of proofs cannot be proven by themselves. So that it breaks down somewhere. So there's even a le level of trust, kind of a level of giving yourself to something, committing yourself to something. So um, I moved away from certainty and I moved to confidence because confidence is basically what really describes who I, how I actually think about my own faith, how I think about the Bible, how I think about like even like the biblical authors, how they kind of struggle with those kind of questions of truth. And it's always emphasized that, that, that trusting the Lord, right, is kind of the core of who we are as Christian beings. Not proving the Lord, but trusting in the Lord, giving yourself to the Lord, committing yourself to who he is. And so there's, there's a sense of it's like, I think like the, 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 the kind of the addiction to certainty that both science has, right? Because science has also certain addiction to certainty because people always talk about the facts and those are certain. Um, if, you, if you have studied science, you know there is never certainty. It's always a level of confidence, like 95% level of confidence or so, so, something like that. So even the scientists don't talk about certainty. The science actually, yeah, they talk about like confidence. Like you, again, you give yourself to something, you commit yourself to something to kind of believe this and you take it for as long as it works. So to a certain extent, you can actually say that the epistemology of science is very similar to the epistemology of the faith. 
So both of them depend on trust. Both of them depend on giving yourself to certain kind of ideas and facts. And both of them can be revised and should be revised in, if it doesn't work anymore, so to say. Well, um, let me jump in and interrupt you on that. Um, mm -hmm. When people speak of confidence in science, it usually ends up, usually, um, self-policing, right? It, 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 if you conduct an experiment in the Netherlands and yep. under the same conditions we conduct one here in Phoenix, we should get the same results. Yep. But confidence and faith rarely produces that. There's some 40,000 plus different denominations in the Christian world alone. And I think when when people hear you say that there's a parallel, uh, they find it wanting in, in the world of faith and religion because mm -hmm. they, there are so many different views and confident voices expressing each of those views. Um, yeah. How do you answer that kind of critique from yeah. Yeah. Sam Harris so, and others? Yeah. yeah. So I think those voices are not, maybe they are confident in the way that they present themselves, but what they present is actually a certainty, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of like different Christian denominations are incredibly certain about their little thing that they're so certain about and everyone else who thinks something different is wrong. And so um, there's not a whole lot of like reflection on those different kind of ideas. There's not a lot of humility, like I could be wrong actually. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you get into those situations where people are so certain about what they believe um, and are willing to split from other people who believe something different, that is not a way that that's not like confidence and trust and humility, but it's actually like the thing that I was just talking about, like an uncertainty that's probably not warranted. That doesn't mean that there's no other questions, right? There's a lot of questions still that you need to struggle with, especially because of so many different denominations, so many different religions as well. But the, the reality is, I don't think it has to do with certain or confidence, but it actually has to do with like a too high of a degree of certainty. Actually, that, does, that's a, that doesn't even work because certainty is 100%, right? And that's what most people think. But too high of a degree of confidence that they have, which then they equate with with certainty and they're not willing to budge and not willing to kind of even like consider different viewpoints. Well, Christina and I were talking before the show. Um, many of the people we talk with who are going through deconstruction or questioning yep. their faith have come out of that background of certainty. And yep. there is a sense of comfort there, right? Where mm -hmm. you, you, you have an answer to everything or you can... Yep consult somebody to get an answer to, for everything. And it, I, I said the metaphor is kind of similar to sitting on a boat in a dock your whole life, hearing about mm -hmm. going to sea, but mm -hmm. never actually going to sea. Yeah. When yeah. you deconstruct, you, you're actually set sail. And, and yeah. part of that uncertainty is discomforting. How did you mm -hmm. navigate that um, when you moved beyond your, your season of doubt? Yeah. I think what I had to learn was to hold things in tension. So um, I came from a background where a lot of things were certain as well. Um, and so some of the things I'm not as certain about anymore, and that's fine. Um, and so to a certain extent, I had to relearn epistemologically to kind of like learn what my faith actually means and emphasize more the trust aspect but at the same time i also i think had to learn to be humble and to learn from other people to read a lot of different things to be willing to engage those different ideas and then hold just keep holding things in tension it's like um not having an answer is sometimes better than to settle on something that is safe um and so Yeah. <laughs> Does it help a little bit? Do you want me yeah. to explain it more? Go deeper I think into it, that? I, I think the idea of getting comfortable with asking questions is mm -hmm. huge. I mean, sometimes yeah. at the start, you're very scared. You're, you're, you're yeah. scared at least to communicate it to other people. But the moment you give yourself warrant to ask, mm -hmm. what if I'm wrong? Or mm -hmm. what if they're right? Or, you know, 
I think there is a great freedom to that, but sometimes when you've been in Plato's cave for a long time, mm -hmm. that sunlight mm -hmm. can be blinding, you know, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and you, you have to adjust and there's yeah. that adjustment period, growing pains, what have you, yeah. that is awkward and yeah. uncomfortable mm -hmm. and, and yeah. scary. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I still have that. Yeah, okay. Sometimes I read something and I have to like, oh, what does this mean for me? <laughs> right? I still like I still like to kind of challenge myself and put myself in situations where I just don't really know what to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I'm just thinking, I mean you grew up in the Netherlands, uh, went to school there, went to school here. Um, yeah. you've taught at a Christian university and now you're at a public university, although you're not a professor, but you're involved mm -hmm. with the with both students and academics at the public university. What kind of differences in culture and questions are you seeing in these different environments? And what are some of the unique challenges um, for each each environment? Yeah. Along along these lines of, of certainty versus confidence versus mm -hmm. faith faith journeys. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously most of the, the conversation that I had at Wheaton uh, were uh, with Christians. So most of the students that I had in my classes uh, were Christian students, but I always said at the very beginning of the class, like this is going to be a challenging class. We are going to read books by atheists. And so if you find yourself in a place where, you, where you're starting to doubt the things that you've believed beforehand or so far in your life, please come and talk with me. I'm here to help you. I don't want you to struggle with that by yourself and I explain my own faith journey. Um, so most of my students were kind of like Christians growing up in very different um, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, Wheaton is as a fairly conservative Christian school, um, had like a fairly conservative group of students still. Um, and um, so the, the range was quite wide uh, from students who um, believed young earth creationism as, um, as like the, the one way to interpret the scriptures to students who were much more open to all kind of different uh, opinions. And also the relationship with God. Some uh, some students very kind of intellectual faith. Some students are very passionate faith. Some very shallow. Some very deep. And so the, the range was very broad. But there wasn't kind of some shared understanding of of the Christian faith. And so many of the questions that I kind of worked through with my students at Wheaton were geared towards them understanding and helping to kind of process their own faith. So okay, so you do believe this. Now, how are you going to square this with science and how are you going to communicate this to people when you step out of Wheaton into the world, so to say? So I said to students, like, in a couple of years, you will sit in, the, in an office, maybe in a cubicle with people who have who don't believe what you believe, who, have, who think that you're totally backwards. And how are you still going to be a Christian there, a faithful Christian? And so it was it was a very kind of like much more like uh, formational kind of Christian theological scientific formation, so to say, helping students to think deeply through what they believe, how they believe it, and challenge that as well. That if they had certain ideas that um, that they felt they couldn't believe anymore, I helped them work through those kind of questions. So um, and then there's also students who are very apathetic. Um, who didn't want to think about it at all though who just had like okay this is another check mark for one of the classes that i want to that i need to take at the at the university of minnesota where i work right now um, i obviously do work with students but most of my conversations are with faculty but i do also have good conversation with students the students that i interact with are either of two groups almost so either they're christians and know really really well what they believe because they have been steeped in this kind of like public university context and have been forced to really think through what they believe or and so they're very well articulate and know what they believe and um, yeah or on the other side students who um, who are Christian but have no idea why they why they believe what they believe um, are have a very kind of like shallow faith and are hungry to kind of grow in that and to kind of like go deeper in that and develop their own understanding of their faith. So it's 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 extremes. I don't see a whole lot of students who are somewhere in the middle. So it's very strongly developed students or students who are much more like, yeah, I'm a Christian, I've grown up in a Christian church my whole life, or maybe I just came to faith and help me now understand what this actually means. Yeah. Yeah, we did have a, a comment from question from Facebook. I think you actually just answered it. But I'm going to oh. share it anyway. 
Uh, Kent says, this is related to Christine's question. AJ, you were a teacher for 11 years at Wheaton. How did you encourage your students to be comfortable in asking the big questions? Or was that not a problem at Wheaton? I, I think you kind of just answered it. If you want to say anything more to that, uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you warrant. But um, let me yep. meld this question with what Christine brought up. And that is that you have like Moses and Paul, a foot in two worlds. You've uh, the European... Uh, background and also being here in America for many years. Um, and you mentioned N.T. Wright earlier, and he's always surprised when he comes to America at the different questions he, he gets here that he doesn't get in the U.K. I know Bonhoeffer had the same experience when he came to the United States. He was underwhelmed with our seminaries and with our churches, other than with the, the African-American churches that he attended mm -hmm. that he felt a real strength of the Holy Spirit there. So let me ask you it like this. In America, a Pew poll recently came out that suggested that evangelical Christians um, had a very high favorable rating of themselves. But among their peers, they were uh, one of the least favorable groups. In other words, I think, uh, let's say Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientologists and Satanists were were the only groups who sco scored lower than evangelicals. So does the American church have different baggage than your experience of the church in the Netherlands and, and elsewhere? And are those big questions that you talk about, are they all universal questions like yearning and suffering, or are some of them more specific to to the United States? Well, um, an answer for so, the whole world, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Take so your time. Yeah, the, the, the history is obviously very different. Mm -hmm. So uh, Europe went through two world wars, right? And so that really changed the, the religious landscape in Europe, um, the philosophical landscape in Europe. Uh, the way that people stand in life. And so that that actually, I do think, has quite significantly affected the churches as well. So um, the horrors of World War I and World War II, where people uh, had to really deeply struggle and wrestle with the question, like, where was God and all of this, led then obviously, like, in the churches to an, a new secularization, one of, one of them, like a lot of people left the church because they could not find this, an, an answer to this question, like, where is God involved? Um, led to kind of existentialism and post existentialism first in France and then postmodernism coming out of that. Um, and but also in the, in the churches, the, the, the people had to wrestle with those kind of questions. And so I do think that the, the climate in the churches um, is geared towards sometimes geared more towards those kind of questions. And pondering those kind of questions in the theology that has been written has been more towards those kind of questions as well. Um, that combined then with a way of structuring society in Europe, which is more um, cohesive when it comes to the community. So the community is sometimes more important than the individual, at least until um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so you see kind of the welfare state. You see... Um, and social democracies that are quite different from here in the United States. You see that the churches have a very, uh, have a role to play in society, but other organizations who are playing at a social level also um, have a big role to play in those different kind of things. So the individual is important, but the community is sometimes more important. Um, so in the Netherlands, we call about, we talk about the polder model, uh, model, uh, model. Uh, that basically means that um, the government, um, um, like unions, um, and then uh, unions of like, uh, or like organizations of like employer, employers, they all come together and they talk about what would be the best for our country over the next five years. And so instead of fighting each other, or pushing down unions to say you cannot exist and things like that. There's a sense in which like, let's talk about this together, finding this dialogue between all different kinds of levels of society, just to find the best for, uh, for society. So that's in the Netherlands and that's true for other uh, countries as well. 
you see a lot of governments are like governments that are coalition governments. So where there's multi-party systems. And so that basically always allows for dialogue and it makes necessity dialogue. Um, and it always um, prevents this, this very strong polarization that you see in a society right now in the United States. So there's a more an, a communal sense. Let's figure this out together and let's all go for kind of like the common good. Now, this might be a little naive, so to say, like in the Netherlands and in other European countries, there's also now more of polarization where kind of like people become more and more extreme and start really starting to vilify each other. But what you saw, at least until like a decade or two decades ago, was that this kind of like this social fabric was true for like society, but also true for the churches. So where people are actually able to have these kind of conversations. That is different here in the United States, right? So here in the United States, it's the individual that always comes first. Never like communal communal good. It's always the individual that comes first. It's kind of like kind of like your your documents, so to say, the founding documents. The, the individual, the freedom of the individual, and not so much like the the society as a as a as a common good, so to say. And so that leads then to kind of like probably for a long time already a two party system, and then also now to an extreme polarization between those two different sides where you're not even in communication anymore. And that leads also in the churches. And again, like there's the kind of the, this idea of certainty, <laughs> like it's not about confidence anymore. We are so certain about of, of our own viewpoints that we're not even willing to consider other people, that we're not even willing to think about other things, that we're not even willing to listen to each other anymore. So the churches and society kind of mirror each other, both in the United States and then in Europe as well. So that's one of the things that I've seen. And... Um, I don't want to create an idealistic view of Europe because there's a lot of problems there as well. But I've always appreciated this ability and a willingness to come together and figure it out together. Something that I've always missed a little bit here. Yeah, I think we're not going to solve uh, U.S. <laughs> politics today. No. <laughs> um, oh, there's there's too much, isn't there? Uh -huh. But there's a mirror there, right? So it's a, yeah, a, a mirroring yeah. between kind of those different kind of things. Yeah. And right. the, the second question that you asked, John, about like the big questions, um, and then going back to Ken's question as well. So there's a little bit more openness to some of those big questions in, in Europe, but there's openness to those questions here in the United States as well. So there's actually quite a lot of parallels, which is very interesting. And the way that I actually have encourage my students, for example, at Wheaton College, to kind of interact with those questions is just to read and listen to the voice of atheists. Um, so um, in my astronomy classes and my cosmology classes that I taught at Wheaton, I read a book by Sean Carroll, who's an atheist, but someone who's really deeply thought about, um, about philosophy and science and those different kind of things. His book is called The Big Picture. And it's actually a fascinating account of a naturalist, so someone who's an atheist who believes that only this world the, like this material world is the only world that, there is, that is true and that is there, how he accounts for kind of like all the big questions in life. So where do we come from? Where are we going? Who are we as human beings? Uh, what is our sense of duty in this world? What's morality? What's consciousness? And all those different questions. And so with my students, I actually read that book um, year after year after year, which was fascinating to see how kind of like uh, students, different student groups respond different to those kind of questions. And so when we read this, um, I always challenge my students, like, okay, like, maybe you disagree with Sean Carroll, but why do you disagree with Sean Carroll here? And how do you actually, f how do you kind of make that clear in a winsome way, right? If you want to have that conversation, you cannot just be judgmental and just dismiss it, but you need to be able to, in a compelling and winsome way, you need to tell about your own hope and about your own perspective and your own ideas about this different kind of thing. So that's always what I challenge my students to do. I'm so glad you said that because there's so many Christian voices and Christian circles that that would uh, be horrified uh, that you'd recommend that they they read the other side. And yet that is a biblical pr principle that until yep. somebody's yep. cross examined that that one yep. argument seems correct. But to consider both sides, to to test and weigh every spirit and mm -hmm. hold on to that, which is sound. Yep. So I really appreciate you doing that. Plus, um, truth doesn't uh, fear scrutiny. So if, if we really believe that we're correct, then then we should want the, to hear the best arguments against mm -hmm. our position and mm -hmm. and to find kind of either to find out that there may be a house of cards that we've we built on sand 
or to, to see that they've held through the storm. So I really yeah. appreciate you saying that, doctor. Yeah. Thank you. What you I, said I, earlier yeah. about the, the X-17, right, Paul, mm. going to the Areopagus and wandering around there and seeing kind of all kind of like the altar to the unknown God, but all the other altars that they were worshiping and things like that. So in seminary, one of my professors, Jerem Bars, really challenged us and said, like, that's a really good way of doing kind of apologetics. And he said, like, whenever you go and talk with people, the first thing that you always want to do is to kind of like um, affirm the truth and good and beautiful things that they also believe. And so that's exactly what Paul does, right? When Paul walks around and they are Areopagus, he looks around and he says, like, here's a couple of things that you guys believe. And that are so beautiful, so true. And he cites their poets, and he talk and the philosophers, and he says like, okay, this is this is what what is beautiful in a way. So he tries to build a bridge, so to say, into their hearts, into their understanding. But then he challenges it, right? He also says like, okay, but like if you go a little deeper now, um, then you ask other questions, and then he comes up with like the creation, and he talks about Jesus, and he talks about the resurrection, and that's where he gets the pushback from people. So he's always connecting with people with the things that they believe that are true and good and beautiful, and he affirms those kind of things. And then out of that, after building kind of like this bridge into their hearts, that's when he starts challenging and, that, and says like, I also have a better story, a more bigger story, something that goes be even deeper than what you believe. And that's what I want my students to know. I think that's the right attitude in this world, uh, that you don't not only just judge people or that you kind of like immediately throw your own ideas into that. Every person believes something that is true and good and beautiful and try to find that and then try to connect with that before you even start bringing up your own story. That seems so very different from um, kind of the typical typical apologetics machine that's in in the United States right now where um, so often I see apologists, actually so often I see them arguing for an alternative to science as a way to mm -hmm. believe in Christianity where yeah. Um, you know, you have to hold intelligent design instead of evolution, mm -hmm. or you have to, mm -hmm. um, you know, God had to have done it this way, and he couldn't have done it that way. And, and, and there's these, you know, arguments trying to prove God, like, like you kind of have talked about having the certainty. And, um, and, 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 and that crumbles when as soon as you find out something they said isn't true. Right, because mm -hmm. then you can't really. How do you believe anything else that they've said, if yeah. they're willing to um, make make these arguments that that are on sand that shifts with the tide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I. I. I I'm really frust I'm frustrated and I'm hurt, sorry. and I. I I, I muted ahead. myself. I'm just so frustrated and hurt, yeah. I was just going to say, there's also so much deceit in that world, unfortunately, <sighs> in the Lord's name, from quote mining to mm -hmm. straw manning, other arguments, that when somebody does actually read outside their tribe, they're astounded by mm -hmm. how flimsy their arguments were or by mm -hmm. just how disingenuous they were mm -hmm. toward, toward other arguments. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a pretty big trust issue in the mm. church right now, too, because of mm. that. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard. Well, How do we rebuild trust? It, well, you know, I have one more question. So because yeah. because one of the things I think of that that can um, I'm not sure if rebuild trust is the right thing, but c can help with the confidence maybe is mm -hmm. is is the role of awe and wonder. Mm -hmm. in in the exploring of nature the study of creation and, and what exists and yeah. a way to be kind of rooted in reality um mm -hmm. so how can that be something that can build confidence for christians when they don't know where to turn when they yeah. don't know who to yeah. trust yeah so there's this uh, this tv series on pbs it's called closer to truth you guys know about that yeah yes it's wonderful show. yeah Oh, absolutely. So this, uh, um, I don't remember his name anymore, but he's an, he's an agnostic and he just mm -hmm. interviews lots and lots of different people, um, Christians, non-Christians, scientists, philosophers, all over the place. And, and the beautiful thing about that is that he, 
he comes back to Christians over and over and over again because they have something to add, something to, like, the, the sense of wonder and the sense of awe has a place in their story. And they're able to talk about that in a way that makes sense, that goes deeper than uh, what sometimes someone who doesn't believe is able to talk about those kind of things. And so it opens, it, the way that I sometimes talk about it, so it sometimes cracks open a naturalistic worldview. Right, so in a naturalistic worldview, there's this sense of like everything is just uh, enclosed, right? It's all imminent. It's all part of this closed system. There's no cause and effects from outside or whatsoever. But then you run up to these kind of experiences of like awe and wonder. You see in a sunset, or you see a mountains, or you see like I saw, saw this week the Northern Lights, and you're just you're like you you feel. To a certain extent, you feel connected to something that's bigger than you, <laughs> and um, and that that experience is not only an experience that Christians have. That experience actually is universal. <laughs> that sense of awe and wonder, and that sense of like we are bigger than this. We're meant to be here. One of the movies that I show uh, to my students in the Black Hills often is uh, Contact, Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey, and. Um, when Jodie Foster flies through kind of like a wormhole and is able to see a celestial kind of like event somewhere, she talks about this, like she basically said, I don't know exactly how she said it, but like, this is so beautiful, so beautiful, so beautiful. Uh, they should have sent a poet, a poet not a scientist. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. does he say that? Mm -hmm. Because there is, there's elements of a human experience that science is not able to grasp, but it is so essential to who we are. Um, that can only be expressed in forms of art or in transcendence or in, in religious language and those different kind of things. And so I think like as Christians, if we are able to focus instead of all the things that we, where we try to prove God and things like that, if we're able to, to be people of wonder and people of awe and recover some of that, um, both in the sciences and in theology, I think that would be a testimony for the world and a testimony for ourselves as well about the, just the beauty of the Christian faith um, and how the Christian faith is able to answer things, able to make sense of things in a way that a naturalistic kind of worldview is not able to do that. I don't, I don't know whether it's the answer, but at least it's, an, it's one of those signposts that I sometimes point to, like that it might point people in a certain direction. I, I just want to jump in and say that I share your love for contact and, and what you're describing that you have taught to your students makes me want to sit in a classroom with you. But, um, you know, Carl Sagan, uh, the church loves mm -hmm. to have enemies and they've kind of demonized Sagan. And yet yep. in that work in contact, he was very, there was an expression of humility that you don't see yep. with yep. Christian uh, authors. And, and there's another part of that movie where McConaughey is speaking mm -hmm. to um, the naturalist, uh, uh, yep. Jodie Foster, yep. and she's basically arguing that the only thing that is real is, um, you, you know, the natural world and something you could prove or uh, yeah. or demonstrate over and over in a laboratory. And he says to her, can you prove you love your father? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Which is yeah. basically a uh, Christian apologetic. That's something C.S. Yeah. Lewis might have said. So I, yeah. I found it fascinating that he acknowledged that and he didn't straw man that, you know, the faith point of view in that movie. So yeah. uh, wonderful yeah. that you yeah. shared that. Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And um, even at the very end, there's and one more scene. Yeah. Where she, where she testifies before the, the committee and she, and they uh, they ask her, like, can you prove that you went there? And she said, like, no, I can't. But I was transformed. I was a changed mm -hmm. being afterwards. And so, like, that's a Christian faith. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fascinating. Well, I hate to do this to you, um, especially after we've connected with contact. But, and I have, I, I'm resurrecting this question. I, I think Christine's probably been relieved. I don't ask this of every guest, but um, this is what I call the hard question. So you talk mm -hmm. about big questions. This is the hard question. You mentioned the Holy Spirit played a role in, in bringing you back. You yeah. felt the Holy Spirit did. And we're told that the, the Holy Spirit will, you know, do a few things like convict the world of, of our mm -hmm. shortcomings of our sin, or possibly lead us into a fuller understanding. So here's my question to you. Um, 
given that we live in a world where uh, we have witnessed the church dig in their heels against science when it came to Copernicus and Galileo and refused to apologize in some cases for a couple hundred years, when, when we see that same church now demonize Darwin and evolution, when we see that church, at least in America, refusing to wear a mask and um, speaking in a rather backward, superstitious manner about the effectiveness of vaccines, when we see that same church who is um, following the lead of the Holy Spirit, at least according, uh, allegedly, and uh, who has the, the, the word of God and the mind of Christ, when we see them uh, dismissing the idea um, of climate science uh, and em embracing a, a nationalist view in their religion, um, isn't, isn't it hard to make a case for the Holy Spirit or is the Holy Spirit a wall absent without leave in our time? How do you convince the skeptic that the church is right about salvation in Jesus when they've been wrong about astronomy, about biology, uh, about infectious disease, um, et cetera? Yeah. Well, wow, that's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I, I think I want to go back to the early church when the Holy Spirit was just given to the people of Israel after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. It transformed their lives and they were able to witness to people of all languages, uh, all nationalities, and did it with a boldness and a confidence. And that is kind of strange, right? Counter-cultural, um, counter their faith, but the Holy Spirit was able to work in them. So the Holy Spirit changes hearts. The Holy Spirit changes people's attitudes and the Holy Spirit gives, gives a boldness and um, shapes a community. And I think as long as we, as American Christians, put the individual above the community, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. So that's an... <laughs> That's a, that's a big, big way of saying it. But I think there's a sense in which the culture, the American culture, and it's not only an American culture, that's, that's broader, especially in the Western culture. As long as we like really emphasize the autonomy of human beings um, and the freedom of human beings without the responsibility that we have to uh, shape a community, a community of believers, and living out faith in a very practical way there, and a way, the way of the Lord and wisdom and sacrifice, right? So we're willing to sacrifice some of our freedoms for the community. If we're not willing to do that, then the Holy Spirit is powerless. We quench the Holy Spirit. And I think that's one of the flaws in American culture and in all modern cultures is that we're not willing to sacrifice and we're not willing to put ourselves behind the community, certainly not behind the church community. It's first ourselves and then other people. And that's a counter to the to the gospel. And so, if that if if you go against the gospel that way, then obviously you quench the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit has no he 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 is willing to able to work with people, but the power of the Holy Spirit is gone a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, in other words, you're, you're basically saying what that that English philosopher said that to view true Christianity. Sometimes it's necessary to ignore all Christians. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And it's, willing, it's necessary to give up yourself, right? Mm -hmm. To willing to give yourself, to sacrifice, willing to kind of like give up your comforts and your freedoms. And sometimes that means giving up like the other Christians in need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to give the last well, one to Christine. I just want to say that well, I think Ans Ansem House is in very good shape when they've got the, a director who can bring the gospel out of the movie Contact. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. No, we really appreciate having you here today, AJ. And yeah. I'm looking forward to the event on the 17th with um, the astronomer from the Vatican. That should be interesting. Um, and looking forward just to seeing you throughout uh, at other events coming up too. So really thank you for your time today. Do you have any final words that you would like to share with our audience of either encouragement or um, challenge to um, when people are wrestling with their faith for, for whatever reason? Yeah, so if you're, so I think my challenge was there already, right? The last comment that I made. Um, if you're wrestling with your faith, um, don't shy away from help, asking for help. Find people, especially if you're at university, uh, find a good Christian community, find a study center, a Christian or a student organization, or a get in contact with people, even online. Uh, don't struggle with it yourself. There's people who are willing to help you um, and to work with you. Uh, the last thing that you need is answers, but the thing that you do need is people who are willing to work with you. And there are people who are willing, willing to do it, to do that. And then I think for the church as a whole, like embrace science. There's so much beauty in there. There's so much wonder in there. There's so much that we can learn from the sciences and from scientists. So instead of like talking about science as being bad, go and talk with scientists who are Christians because they can tell you a whole different story and they can tell you how they stand in, in this and the beauty that they see there and the complexity and even God's hand in their research and things like that. So instead of making like demons out of like big things, find people that you can talk to, make, befriend them and learn from them. And I think, um, and that's basically the community again, right? And so I think then this world will be a very different place instead of demonizing people and polarizing and throwing all kind of different words out there. Just get to know them. Well, doctor, thank you for joining us. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you again shortly.